And let me also welcome Andrew once more. Our speaker today is Andrew Stewart. Andrew is a professor of computing and mathematics at Caltech. And I think it's fair, not just judging from his job title, that he likes to live on the boundaries between subjects. He obtained his PhD in 1986 here in Oxford from what was then called the computing laboratory. Before moving to Caltech, he had faculty positions both in mathematics and engineering science at the universities of Warwick, Princeton, and Bath. For his work, he has received numerous prestigious awards on both sides of the Atlantic, and he was elected a fellow of the Royal Society in 2020. Andrew is passionate about the combination of rigorous mathematical tools and models with the vast data sets of present times. He applies this first principle thinking to problems such as unfolding or the analysis of stochastic systems. As we've heard in the last three talks in this series, machine learning provides very powerful methods to address these very challenges in the context of meteorology. And in his talk today, Andrew will complete the picture by telling us how machine learning can help to solve some of the equations that take center stage in climate models. Andrew, please go ahead. Thank you, Philip. And, and thank you to both Philip and Peter for the invitation. It's great to have this opportunity to speak to you. Um, I'm aware that it's a fairly wide, potentially fairly wide audience from different backgrounds. And I would very much welcome interruptions and questions as we go along so that you can help um, adjust your understanding in a way that will make the talk more enjoyable. So the, the work I'm going to talk about is, the title is there. I'm interested in using data to learn solution operators for partial differential equations. Um, but as I discuss at the end, there will be potentially wider application of this methodology. But the simple take home idea is that solving partial differential equations is expensive. It's something that we do many times. And if we record the inputs and the outputs to the um, numerical solution of partial differential equations, we have the opportunity to replace the numerical solution of a partial differential equation by a learnt machine learning model, which is cheaper and faster to evaluate. And I want to discuss some of the theory that underpins that and some applications of that way of thinking. The work is joint with many people who I will describe uh, as we go through the talk. And um, the, the way I'm going to organize the talk is as follows. So uh, in, in the problem setting, I'll just describe the basic idea and um, the concept that I want to uh, study in a number of different settings. And then I'm going to look at two ways of um, generalizing the idea of supervised learning and neural networks in particular to the problem of learning mappings which take spaces of functions into spaces of functions. So the first of these will be the kernel network approach. And having developed it, shown you a little bit of the concept and the theory, I'll describe uh, applications of that methodology in fluid mechanics. And, sorry, it's a mistake. And uh, then I will look at a second method based on model reduction. And I will describe application of that in, um, solid mechanics to a problem in crystal plasticity. I'm happy to make the slides available and the references um, will be, you'll be able to pursue the references in more detail um, by having the slides made available to you. So let, let me try and describe the objective of this work in, um, in an abstract setting. So there are many problems, as I mentioned, typically arising in partial differential equations, but much more generally than that, where one has an input output map, which throughout the talk will be psi dagger, which takes a space of functions x into another space of functions y. So the inputs and the outputs of this map are themselves functions. And that, that way of thinking about the problem is um, key to understanding what I will try and explain in this talk. So the data is given to us in form of pairs xn and yn, where the xn are inputs to psi dagger, so the xn are functions, and the yn are outputs from psi dagger, so they are functions. 
and that they are assumed Y and an XN to be related through the map Psi dagger. <clears throat> and just to fix ideas and put ourselves in the standard setting of supervised learning, I will assume that the XN are distributed according to a probability measure that I will call mu. The objective is to try and discover Psi dagger from this data. Okay, so we're given these pairs of functions. That's all we know about Psi dagger. And what we're going to try and do is fit a, um, what I call an operator class. So Psi is a function which takes X to Y that is parameterized by theta. And our objective is to choose a, a particular distinguished parameter theta star so that what we learn using neural networks in the case of this talk, um, the function psi at the parameter theta star is a good approximation of psi dagger, which is not necessarily known to us except through the data xn and yn. So this is the standard setting of supervised learning. Um, the only thing that's non-standard about it is that the inputs and the outputs are functions. So the, the successes of machine learning that we've seen over the last, especially the last decade, have concerned cases where um, the input space X is Euclidean space, uh, very high dimensional, and the output space may itself also be Euclidean space, or maybe, uh, for example, a set of classes of finite cardinality. So a, a classic example is uh, image classification, where the input space would be um, pixelated images, so a very high dimensional vector space in Rn, and the output space will be uh, classes classifying the images. <clears throat> in this case, the inputs and the outputs are functions, and the key idea that I want to get across is that effective methods in this area follow from thinking about designing the architecture, that's the parametric dependence of the class that we try and fit, thinking of designing that on function space. So Banach space means in this talk, spaces of functions, and then discretize. Um, a different approach, and I will show you drawbacks of it, would simply be to discretize the spaces of functions and apply standard neural network methodology. But I want to show you that that doesn't work so well. And I want to explain to you <coughs> how methods that we have designed which uh, work directly on spaces of functions and are then discretized are much more effective. That's the take home message, but I want to substantiate it. But at first, let me ask if there are any questions on the setting. Okay, so let me start with an example. I'm going to look at um, a partial differential equation from the study of porous medium flow. It's an elliptic partial differential equation and it, it's made up of the following. So we have a, a velocity field V, <clears throat> permeability A, which characterizes the um, porous medium in question, and the pressure U, or it's actually the piezometric head, but uh, you can think of it as being pressure. <clears throat> then the equations of interest are mass conservation, which states the divergence of velocity is given by the sources and the sinks. Uh, the Darcy closure, which is a constitutive model relevant for porous medium flow <clears throat> that says that the velocity field is proportional to the gradient of the pressure and the constant of proportionality is a permeability A. And then for simplicity, I'm going to specify the pressure on the boundary of the domain D. So if you substitute this Darcy model for V into this equation, you get an elliptic differential equation for the pressure U, which depends on the permeability of the medium A. <clears throat> and what I'm going to look at is trying to, to learn the mapping which takes the permeability, which is a function, that's a field over the domain D, and maps it into the pressure, which is also a function, a field over the domain D. <clears throat> and throughout this talk, I will measure error in a relative sense. So I will look at the difference between the truth, which we will have access to for the examples I look at, uh, and the model that we train uh, in a relative sense. Excuse me, do we assume uniqueness of uh, mapping from A to U? 
thank you. That really good question. Um, throughout this talk, yes, and this equation has a uniqueness property um, for provided A has sufficient regularity, it needs to be an L infinity function, then there will be a unique solution to this problem. Um, th there are interesting questions where one has multiple solutions and th that's something that we haven't really tackled in detail, but it is a very natural future direction for this, this methodology. Thank you. Okay, um, what I'm gonna show you here is what happens if you apply the what I'll call naive approach, which is to discretize everything in sight. So you have high dimensional input and output spaces, construct an architecture, and then look at how that architecture performs at different levels of resolution. So what we have here is a measure of error against resolution, error on the vertical axis um, and resolution on the horizontal axis. And uh, this is a, a really nice piece of work by Zhu and Zabaras, which was developed at a particular resolution, which is the, the coarsest resolution down here of a 50 by 50 grid. And uh, they here obtained um, a relative error of less than 2%. However, if you take the architecture that they designed on that particular mesh, and then use it on different meshes, <clears throat> you see that the error increases. And that's because the architecture has been tuned to a specific discretization and is not capturing the intrinsic physics. So the methodology I want to propose in this talk is a methodology that tries to capture the intrinsic physics of the partial differential equation and not be entwined with any specific discretization. Using that method or that philosophy and a specific instance of the method, you can obtain um, relative error, test error, again on the vertical axis as a function of resolution, which is constant, meaning, for example, that it's possible to train the neural network at a relatively coarse resolution and use the same neural network with the same choices of parameters at a fine resolution and obtain the same error. Okay. There are in fact three curves here and the parameter D is a parameter of the neural network. And I will explain what that is later in the talk. But the key, the key idea which I want to get over is found by comparing this figure and this figure. So this figure is one in which one discretizes the problem, learns an architecture, and then tries to use that more widely. That behaves badly. And instead I'm proposing that you conceive of the architecture without discretization. So you do that on the space of functions and um, then look at the method uh, at different resolutions and you find that you're able to transfer between different resolutions and indeed between different discretization methods such as finite difference, finite element and spectral. Now, sorry, I hope it's not too late to ask, but uh, what do you exactly mean by discretization here? So in this particular <clears throat> example, the discretization has been performed, um, not too late to ask. This, could, uh, this is a partial differential equation in space, and we've discretized the spatial variable by a finite difference method. And so the resolution refers, the number 50 here, for example, refers to the use, uh, the computations are done on a two-dimensional grid that is 50 by 50, and up here, it's a two dimensional grid that's 400 by 400. So the partial differential equation is being approximated at different levels of resolution. Thank you. Thanks. Good question, thank you. Okay, Sorry, so that's for, the yes. Sorry for a basic question. And is the neural network trained separately for each resolution? <clears throat> it is here. So in this case, uh, we've trained the neural network in this figure for each separate resolution and obtain the same error. But we have similar figures where we train at one resolution and use those fixed parameters at another resolution. And in the previous case where the error was getting worse? Yes, in here, in this case, we uh, trained it at every resolution, but we used the same architecture that had been proposed at the coarsest resolution. Thanks very much. Thank you. All right, that's the idea. So, um, I, now there's going to be two specific instances of this idea. So two neural network concepts uh, mapping between spaces of functions. 
And in each case, the first case applications to fluid mechanics and the second case applications to solid mechanics. So um, this is joint work with a number of people and I just want to tell you who they are. So the first, uh, Zong Yi is a PhD student at Caltech in computer science. Uh, Nick is a PhD student in applied mathematics. Uh, Kamya is an assistant professor at University of Purdue, was formerly a postdoc um, at Caltech. Uh, Bergada is a postdoc in mechanical engineering at Caltech and is about to take up an assistant professorship at Cambridge in mechanical engineering. Uh, Kaushik is a colleague in mechanical engineering and uh, Anima is a colleague who works in computer science. There are a number of papers here and uh, as I say, I make the slides available uh, afterwards and you can get hold of them through Philip if you're interested or perhaps they can go on the YouTube channel alongside the recording. So let me describe the, the basic idea of generalizing, um, in this case, deep neural networks to the setting in which the inputs and the outputs are functions. So first, let me just describe uh, how neural networks work as mappings between Rm and uh, another Euclidean space. So they typically have this structure here. Um, and I just want to concentrate on the red part of the problem because that's where the, the essential differences in infinite dimensions mapping between spaces of functions will show up. But in this basic version of uh, deep neural network, we start with the linear transformation of the input X um, with parameters matrix A0 and vector B0, which need to be learned. And then uh, we iterate this red map here, again with parameters matrix AL, possibly of changing dimension and vector BL. Um, where um, the first V0 is computed from this layer here. And sigma will be, um, be a sigmoid function. Um, the ReLU would be uh, one example, but think of it as a, a, a monotonic uh, function from R to R applied component wise to this vector. And then one has uh, maybe another linear layer at the end. And that defines the mapping psi which takes the input X and computes this output through this iteration. And the parameters theta are just made up of all of these matrices A's and vectors B. They're learnt and this is fit to data. All right, so that, that's a classical deep neural network. And there is a lot uh, known about this in terms of theory, approximation theory. And there is also abundant evidence that this provides a flexible and um, efficient method of approximating functions from data. So the generalization I'm going to describe here, which um, will form the first half of the talk, we're here now looking at mapping functions, so function space X, and I'll think of functions on a domain in Rn into Rm. So every input will be such a function, and the output will be a function also defined on Rn mapping into R, R. Um, it's not necessary that the, the domain D is the same for the input and output, but I will, in this case, assume that it is. The, the key difference of the architectures that I'm going to work with in this half of the talk is described by the red line. The, the, um, the, the inputs and the, the first layer and the last layer in this particular example are, are just linear and applied point-wise. So they only involve learning a matrix uh, A0 vector B0, and they're just applied pointwise to the function X, uh, evaluated every point Z in the domain D, every point Z in the domain D. <clears throat> What's new about this architecture is the red layer here, and it, it involves pointwise evaluation of V and modification through a linear matrix AL and a shift through a vector BL minus one. Uh, th that does not depend on Z, that's a typo. But the, the, the key difference here is that we also have an integral kernel operator. So this is a non-local operator that maps uh, the, the, the um, solution at the L minus one layer. So this is a function VL minus one, sorry, difficulty highlighting. Um, let me just look where my cursor is. 
at the VL minus one is the function at the L minus one step. We apply a kernel to it and integrate. And now the parameters of this neural network that need to be learned are the A's and the B's as before. As I said, that should not be a B of Z. That's just a, a vector B. Um, but we also need to learn kernel functions. And we, so that's these KLs. And uh, we parameterize these too and learn them. So this uh, describes an architecture which is made up of both pointwise and non-local operators. And uh, the key thing to appreciate about it, there's, uh, there's a lot of theory being developed right now in this area, but let me just tell you that there, there are universal approximation theorems for this architecture as a mapping between spaces of functions. And there are also other methodologies um, such as deep O-net, which is being developed at, uh, by Kanye Darkis and co-workers at Brown University. And this theory about that, um, based on this paper of Chen and Chen, which was the first I'm aware of to look at approximating uh, mappings between spaces of functions. There's also work that I don't refer to here <coughs> coming out of ETH by Sid Mishra and Samuel Lanthaler which uh, looks at convergence proofs for um, architectures that map between spaces of functions. And we ourselves have a paper that will be looking at that problem too. The basic point is that, that there are universal approximation theorems within the class of neural networks that I've just described to you. However, um, what you might think is Okay, this is good, but what about the computational complexity? So we know there are universal approximation theorems. Uh, this kernel is non-local and in general will be dense. And as a consequence, um, if one uh, thinks in terms of discretizing this kernel integral operator, um, one gets n squared computational complexity, which is potentially um, makes the method rather unattractive, both for, in terms of training and um, using as a predictor. So yeah. we uh, have, a, sorry. Can I, a ask a, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, so the previous slide, um, uh, one before that as well. Yes. Um, so it is, it essentially is the idea that we learn these weights and biases of the network um, so that it generalizes across any value of Z. So that we can we can evaluate this function at any point in its space. Yes, exactly. I, I, I think of it more as the, the input points and the output points are themselves functions. And we the way I would say it is that um, we try and choose the, the parameters theta, which is the weights and the biases and the kernels, so that um, we approximate the mapping that takes functions to functions. Um, and we do that in a norm which respects the probability measure on the input functions that I, um, I called it mu at the beginning. So that the, the error is small with respect to a measure that is defined, um, a measure of accuracy that respects where the function input functions come from with respect to the probability measure. Um, so that, that provides one measure of error, um, but the specific theorem I've mentioned involves the continuous functions. And so in that specific setting, um, you can think in the, exactly the way you described that the method will be pointwise accurate. Okay, thanks. Thanks. But the, the broader question that you're asking translates into uh, what is the norm that you put on measuring the difference between psi dagger and uh, psi. And, and th there are different ways of doing that. And some of the theory I mentioned works in uniform topology, which is the, what you were referring to. And some of it works in Sobolev spaces, which works in an L2 sense with respect to derivatives of the function spaces in the space, in the functions, in the rele relevant spaces. Thank you. Sorry, um, I also have a question. Um, what's the role or the interpretation of, the, uh, of your kernel? and of the integral operator in red in the previous slides? Yeah, so if this is gonna work, it has to be non-local. Um, and that's because the mappings that I'm interested in are non-local. If you take um, a particular point Z and evaluate the input there, 
it does not determine the output at um, the same point Z. You need to know uh, the entire function everywhere in the domain D to determine the output at a given point in, uh, in Z. And so the operator, if, this, if there's going to be a universal approximation theorem, uh, you, have to, you have to add non-locality into the picture. I'll do it in a different way in the second half of the talk, but in this part of the talk, we're doing it through kernel integral operators, which are a very natural way of introducing non-locality. And in some very specific problems, such as if you think about Green's functions, how they work, um, you can clearly see the role of kernel integral operators in that setting. And it then turns out that um, through the universal approximation theorem that we can um, approximate many mappings using this formulation. And so the potential bottleneck, which I'm about to address, is the cost of doing this. So that, that's what I'm going to next. Thanks. Thank you. So regarding cost, there are a number of um, ways around the n squared complexity of the kernel integral operator. But the, the one that will be presented in the examples in this talk is to work in Fourier space and um, to use translation invariant kernels. And it, it, actually, if you like, this is very much related to uh, convolutional neural networks and thinking about what they would mean in the case where the images which are used as inputs are, are in fact functions. Um, but the, the computational advantage is that the, uh, the convolution um, can be computed in Fourier space and reducing complexity from n squared to n log n. And the, the methods I describe will use that today, but we have other methods using graph methodology and the links that I gave within the talk can be used to follow those ways of reducing the complexity as well. But for this talk, Fourier is enough. That's all you need to understand. All right, let me show you an example, which comes from Berger's equation. So this is a time-dependent partial differential equation that has um, two characteristics. You have dissipation, which is preferentially stronger at large, uh, at, at short length scales. And you have an energy conserving nonlinearity, which in Fourier space transfers energy from low to high wave numbers. Um, what we're interested in here is the solution operator that maps the initial condition to the solution at time one. So we're trying to find a function that replaces integrating the equation. It will be trained by a numerical, by data obtained from a numerical method. But once you have it, you, you don't have to use the numerical method anymore. You just evaluate psi, our approximation to psi dagger, to replace the solution of the equation. So this is just, for those of you not familiar with the equation, this is typical uh, behavior of the equation. Um, this should not be A, that should be U zero, and this U should be the output at time one. So on the left is an initial condition, on the right is the solution at time one. So this equation forms a shock, uh, which is, has a certain thickness related to the parameter nu, which is the viscosity appearing in the second derivative. So, um, there are lots of different methods compared on here. Um, I'm comparing, as I did earlier, the predictive error on the vertical axis against the resolution of the computation. That's the number of points used to discretize space. And I'm looking at the, um, let's, just, I'm, let's just pick two of these methods. Um, the, the lowest one is the Fourier version of the neural network that I described. And what you see here is a fully connected neural network. So this will be a standard. This is what you would get if you discretize and apply state-of-the-art neural networks on each finite dimensional space. So a key point here in comparing the blue curve and the curve here is that the method we describe um, is invariant to resolution because we are approximating something that is intrinsic to the physics of the equation. And secondly, the, the values of the error at all resolutions are the smallest amongst all of these methods, and in particular, in comparison with the standard um, fully connected neural network. So uh, something that if you come from numerical analysis, sometimes the, these, these curves are a bit confusing because standard, in the standard setting, numerical analysts think of error improving with resolution. But remember here, there's a finite amount of data and um, what's limiting the accuracy here is the finite amount of data. 
So what you're seeing in this method that we've learned here is that at every level of resolution, we squeeze the um, maximum out of the data available and get the error in this case uh, down to um, about 2%. Okay, any questions on that? And can um, I ask a question about training? Yes. Is it, so this non-local term necessitates any special thing to ensure convergence or is just vanilla STD enough to, to um, still train these networks? That, that's a really good question. So in general, I like to say that I, I try to separate the training from um, the things I'm concentrating on in this talk, which are the approximation capabilities and what you can do having trained. Um, but it, it is a fairly standard training, but as you doubtless know, um, it very much depends on who is doing it, that you, there are many parameters to be set when you use off-the-shelf software to train neural networks, which, which is what we're doing here. Um, but th there is definitely a degree of the e expertise of the person doing the training that makes a difference. Um, I wish neural networks weren't like that, and it is arguably one of the drawbacks. Um, but it is, it's, a, it's a standard framework, and Zhong Yi, who is primarily responsible for much of the numerics you'll see in this half of the talk is, is really excellent at getting the most out of um, standard methodology. So it's, it's using, I, yes, sorry, P please. Uh, I, I was wondering with this setup that you have to look at the Banach spaces on the input and output, is it a possibility to also look at all um, partial differential equations or solution operators for nearby equations at the same time. So instead of considering one partial differential equation, look at the approximation of the inverse really, or the solution operator also parameterized by the differential operators. Yes, and uh, absolutely. So um, the first problem I described, but, um, the Darcy problem was parametric dependence. Um, so there I was indeed looking at the parametric dependence on the coefficient um, and learning that mapping. Here for Berger's equation, I'm learning the mapping from the initial condition to the solution at a later time. And those two, those two can be combined. So you can look at um, the joint mapping from the, for example, from the initial condition to crossed with um, some coefficients that define the operator. That's uh, possible within this framework. Very good, thank you. Okay, so let me go on to um, the Berger's equation was a warm up. Let me look at some more complex problems in fluid mechanics. So I'm, I'm going to make a shift here to a different way of thinking about the accuracy of the method because I'm going to start looking at chaotic partial differential equations. And I'm taking the perspective that what is interesting here is to ensure that the statistics of what we learn as a map are reproducible and reproduce the true statistics. Um, and that is recognizing the fact that trajectory prediction is uh, hard over long time horizons in chaotic systems. So if you were doing numerical weather prediction, um, what I'm about to describe would not be so relevant. If you're doing climatology, where you're interested in predictions of statistics, this perspective is more relevant. So what I'm going to do is learn the solution operator over a time h, but having learned it, I'm going to compose it with itself to make predictions about the statistics of the system. And I'm going to compare them with the statistics of the true equation. So let's start by looking at uh, the kuramoto sivashinsky equation. And th this is, so S1 is just, that just means periodic boundary conditions are on a domain of length L. All right, and if for those of you who don't know this, this is um, an equation that arises, for example, in the study of um, fluid mechanics of flames. The, the mathematical um, properties of this equation are as follows. The linear operator is unstable at low wavelengths and dissipative at high wavelengths and increasingly dissipative at higher and higher wavelengths. So the linear operator generates energy at low wave numbers and removes it at high wave numbers. And the nonlinearity as for Berger's equation 
uh, conserves energy, but transfers energy from low to high wave numbers. So you have an, a generation of energy at low wave numbers, you have a transfer through nonlinearity, and you have a removal of energy at high wave numbers. So very much the picture that you have in um, incompressible fluid mechanics. And um, it, the, the result of that is a chaotic partial differential equation. As I said, we're going to learn the operator that takes the solution at time t to the solution at time t plus h for some fixed h. And then we're going to iterate that map to make predictions about long-term statistics. Um, so a commonly used methodology in this area are uh, LSTMs or uh, GRUs. And they, they, so these are both um, methods that are souped up recurrent neural networks. And they are developed to, to try and deal with memory effects. Um, they're rather, in my opinion, rather unattractive as um, approximations of the problem I'm describing because they introduce memory where the, the equation itself is Markovian. So there is a map that takes the solution at time tau to the solution at time tau plus h, and there is no memory. So here memory is in a sense, in, in the LSTM and GRU, memory is introduced to help with the approximation theory, but it takes you into a class of approximations that are don't fit with the equation. Um, we take the Fourier neural operator approach, learn the map over a time interval of length h and iterate it. Um, what you see here, the, the, the solution here is being plotted as the function of space along the horizontal axis and time along the vertical axis. And you see the error of um, LSTM GRU and our method. Black is small. And what you're seeing in terms of trajectory here is simply that we are able to approximate trajectory accurately, accurately for a longer time. Um, but I want to get down into a little bit more detail and show you uh, some of the statistics that come out of this. So on the let's look at the left panel, both of, first of all. There, um, the, the, the blue and the red are two slightly different ways of training, and the dashed versus the solid, uh, are, this is really what I want to emphasize, the dashed is learning the mapping over a time step h and looking at the error only on a time interval of length h. And so what you see there is that as a function of h, uh, the error grows and, and very small at small h and grows uh, as h grows. That reflects the fact that it's harder to learn the map over longer time intervals because of the chaotic response of the system. Um, having learned the map over any time interval h, we then um, compose the map with itself to make a prediction over a macroscopic time t. And we then look at the error in red or blue, slightly different uh, measures of error, but the, the key point is the difference between the dashed and the solid. But when we compose the time h map with itself and make a prediction over a macroscopic time, we get the errors that you see with the solid curves, which are relative error of less than 1%. So what this shows, the left-hand panel, is that the idea of learning this, uh, we're really learning the um, semi-group generated by this equation over a small time interval. And we're then iterating that to make predictions over longer time intervals. And we're showing that that works. All right, that's the left-hand panel. The middle panel is now comparing the ability to predict the spectrum um, with our method and with the LSTM and GRU. And the takeaway is that, that they all do pretty well, but when you start getting down to high wave numbers, uh, our method is fitting the spectrum better than the LSTM and GRU. Um, this figure on the right is looking at the spatial correlation. And um, well, firstly, let me say that that's the very long scale correlations in this problem, and it's very hard to get them. And none of the methods really nail the correlations uh, at uh, long leg scales, that's in the middle here. Um, but they do well um, over on the left. And, and again, the, our Fourier neural, Fourier neural operator approach beats LSTM and the GRU. So the simple take home mes message of this is that learning the solution operator on short intervals 
and then composing it to get predictions over long intervals works well, um, both in terms of measuring the trajectory error into macroscopic time and in terms of looking at the statistics of the resulting dynamical system. Okay, any questions on that? Just a quick question, what's that gradient in the, uh, what's the spectral gradient in the Fourier spectrum? You mean, what's the slope? Yeah, is that minus four or? I, I should know and I don't, I'm sorry. Um, oh, no I'll, problem. <laughs> I'll, next time I know, give the talk, I'll know the answer to that. Um, but but there, the truth is in here, that's this line here. So um, the truth as in computed by very high resolution um, spectral method in space, and we use uh, exponential time differencing which uses the exact solution of the linear operator. So I think the truth is very accurate. I'll find out the answer, but I'm sorry, I don't know it. Thanks. Thank you. All right, now I'm going to look at very much the same setting that we had for KS equation for the for Kolmogorov flow. So these are um, 2D incompressible Navier-Stokes equation on a torus, so periodic in space. Um, with particular Kolmogorov flow, for those of you that haven't seen it, refer to specific forcings um, made up of um, small numbers of Fourier modes or eigenfunctions of the Stokes operator, if you like. Um, I'm going to do exactly the same as we did for the KS Kuramoto Savashinsky. I'm going to learn the solution operator and then compose it with itself. The learnt operator, I'm going to compose it with itself to make predictions at macroscopic times and to, um, to look at statistics. Uh, we use vorticity stream function formulation. There's a lot of information in here in a table, which I won't go through in detail, but you can train on the stream function, the velocity or the vorticity, and we have tried all three. And you can also use different norms to measure the error in the stream function, the velocity or the vorticity. And we have looked at different norms, the L, L2 norm, H1 norm, and H2 norm. So we have a picture of the effect of using different um, variables to represent this flow, stream function, velocity, or vorticity, and of the effect of using different error measures to do the training and the testing. Um, we have tested Reynolds numbers of around 500, but the results are not fully <clears throat> complete. Uh, for what I want to show in this talk. So everything here is with a Reynolds number of around 40. And, and these are samples from the flow. So you have some idea of the complexity. It's relatively low dimensional, but chaotic. And that just to give you a little bit more insight into the flow, um, here we have projected the flow. We do a PCA on the output and project onto the two energy dominant modes. Uh, and what you see is that, um, you have approximately a ring on which the solution likes to live, but there's a lot of activity inside the, inside the ring. And th th these are color coded by the amount of dissipation present in the solution at any given time. So that's the uh, H1 norm squared. And so, so what you see is that the higher dissipation is associated with leaving this, this ring. And so a typical solution on the ring here in space on the left and a typical solution inside the ring at, at the right. All right, so it's chaotic, but relatively low dimensional. I think that's the take home message from this. And um, here we've compared, our method here is called MNO, that's the Fourier neural operator, um, but then composed in a Markovian way to make macroscopic predictions. And we've trained that using both H0, which is the L2 norm and H2, which is the, uh, um, the, the L2 norm of the second derivatives. Um, basically, the, and, and we're comparing this with UNET, which is a standard um, method used in this field. The, the key point here is that in terms of matching the spectrum, um, we get, the, by using our methodology with an uh, H2, that's matching the second derivatives, we, we get an um, almost exact fit with the true uh, minus five thirds spectrum. You can also look at the um, invariant measure um, projected onto dissipation. That's the squared norm of the gradient of the velocity field. And again, you, you're seeing that um, 
our methodology is producing a much better fit than the uh, UNET methodology. The green is the truth, ours is the dotted orange. And here is a study of the um, accuracy of the method as a function of the derivatives used in the fitting. All right, there's a lot of numbers here, but I don't want to show you those. Um, I, I want to finish by just telling you that there's a, the slides are available if you want to look at these numbers. They, they get into details about how the different ways of doing the training affect the accuracy. So just, we, we can train on stream function velocity and, vo and vorticity, any of those three. And we can also apply an L2 norm, an H1 norm, or an H2 norm. And the, 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 these have implications for the error which are summarized in this table if you're interested. Um, I want to describe a different method. And um, th this is work with, uh, I've also already introduced uh, Kaushik and Nick. Um, this is also work with Bamdad, who is a, a currently a postdoc at Caltech and soon to be an assistant professor at the University of Washington in applied mathematics. So this is a different idea and I just want to describe it to you very quickly. It actually underlies the very first example I did for porous medium flow. Um, we're trying to find a map on the left here, psi dagger, which takes an input function space X into an output function space Y. The basic method here is to learn what's called an autoencoder, um, which is an approximate factorization of the identity uh, in the input and the output space using the data. So G composed with F is approximately the identity decomposed in, in both the input and the output spaces. And uh, in fact, we will use PCA, so that principal components analysis, to, to find that autoencoder. We tried other things, but that was the best. And we also have a theory for the PCA, which I'll describe. The point is, these approximate factorizations of the identity on, an, on the function space X uh, introduce a latent space, which is finite dimensional, in both the input space and the output space. And we then train a neural network in this latent space, that's here, and the resulting architecture is made up of this step, which um, is taking the infinite dimensional input and projecting it onto a finite dimensional latent space, learning a neural network that maps between the input and output in the latent space, and then lifting this latent space back up to infinite dimensions. And the accuracy of this method um, is controlled by the, the extent to which these are accurate factorizations of the identity. And that can be studied using the theory of principal components analysis on function space. And then the accuracy of the neural network trained in, in the latent space, which can be controlled with the theory of neural networks. So, Again, there's a theorem that shows that uh, this is provably accurate methodology for the learning of maps between function spaces. I've showed you already this problem, which is the Darcy problem. Now I've put everything together, eliminated the velocity and written it as an elliptic PDE. And, and coming back to Peter's earlier question, we are indeed here learning the mapping from the coefficient, which is a function to the solution U, which is a function. And, um, Th this could be combined with learning dependence on the initial condition and time dependent problems. Um, so the, the kind of inputs that are relevant in this domain are a piecewise constant, for example, of the type you see on the left, and um, that's the permeability and the pressure or piezometric head on the right is the output. Um, so uh, just to remind you, this was the first example I showed you in which we obtained resolution invariant approximation of the true operator mapping the permeability to the pressure. Um, what I want to just finish with is show you the application of this method in crystal plasticity. So you, you've seen all the um, co-workers on this paper beforehand, They're the same as the co-workers on the Fourier neural operator paper. Um, th so this is a problem in solid mechanics and homogenization. So the Equations may or may not be familiar to you, but let me just say that the basic equations are nonlinear wave equations um, for U, which describes the small deformations of the material. And um, the, the, the model is completed by a constitutive model, P. P is the stress tensor, um, which depends on the gradient of the deformations, U, 
some internal variables which carry memory. Um, this is not an elastic response with an inelastic response. Um, I, so that I haven't written down the, the equations for the memory psi, but there are dynamical evolution equations for the internal variables psi. And there, the, this is a homogenization setting where there's a small length scale epsilon inside the stress tensor. That small length scale makes this nonlinear wave equation extremely expensive to compute with. And what we are going to do is use homogenization, misspelt here, um, to, and um, neural networks to learn a homogenized constitutive law. So the, the microscale model that I describe here that includes the small scale has a constitutive model which maps the um, gradient of the deformation, the strain, the memory variables, the internal variables psi, and this small parameter epsilon into the stress tensor. And what we're going to do is homogenize this, but we're going to remove the small scales, and we're going to compute a um, stress tensor P bar, which involves the past history of the strain. So if you like, we're constructing a constitutive model um, which depends not pointwise in time on the strain, so that in general, in this area, you're interested in uh, constitutive models that map um, the stress-strain relationship, mapping strain to stress. And the, uh, here we're working with the history of the strain and mapping that to the stress. And we're going to learn p-bar using machine learning. Right, so the output of this is a nonlinear wave equation that depends on the past history of the strain through a p-bar which we learn with machine learning. Okay, so the, 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 the benefit of this is that the machine learning can be done offline before the computation. And then when one has p-bar, you've eliminated epsilon and the cost of the computation is decreased significantly. There are a number of challenges here, but the primary one is that um, in a testing training scenario for neural networks, we don't know how to, we don't know the correct training data because the correct training data will depend on the solution of the problem that we wish to solve. So what we do is we train on random paths and we've shown by testing that training on random paths, we're able to make predictions, um, random strainings, we're able to make predictions for more systematic straining such as uniaxial tension and loading and unloading. So that is really showing what's in machine learning, it's related to transfer learning where you train with respect to one measure and um, predict with respect to another. The key point is that having done this, um, we're able to get massive order of magnitude speed up. If you use what's called FEM squared, which involves finite element discretization of the microscale plugged into the macroscale computation, we're getting order of a million speed up by doing this. And even over Taylor averaging, which is a um, localizing approximation that's widely used in this field to speed things up, we are getting still three orders of a magnitude speed up in this computation. So this is computation of a blunt impact on a piece of um, metal. All right, um, I've, I've uh, used up my time. I, I just wanted to say that um, I don't need to convince many of you, I'm sure, that neural networks have an enormous amount of empirical success, um, but have typically been used for regression problems on Euclidean spaces and classification problems. Um, what we've done is taken the idea and replaced the input and output spaces by spaces of functions. And I believe that will be widely useful in many areas of science and engineering. The key idea is to conceive of the architecture and then discretize. There are generalizations here. I looked at neural networks, but there are other methods, the random features method. Uh, and I would highlight this work with Nick Nelson, which shows that similar ideas, but with the architecture. Um, there's a lot to be done in this area. So we've looked at PDEs, uh, but you can imagine problems where you don't have a model. So you're just given data. So there are many problems in robotics, for example, which are generating large amounts of data for which the models are very incomplete. And there's a possibility of learning directly from time series uh, models from this using this methodology. There's a lot of math needed. Um, there's starting to be approximation theory, but that is at the beginning, there's much needed. Um, there are interesting questions around theory in the chaotic setting. 
uh, which I described here, application to inverse forms, in, uh, experimental design and many applications. I'm really grateful to you for listening and all the great questions. Thank you, and I'm happy to take more. Thanks a lot, Andrew. That was indeed a fascinating talk. <laughs> great, thanks a lot. Thanks. Okay, uh, we've had lots of discussion already, which is great. Uh, if people have more questions, then please, now is the time. Hello. Can I ask a question, please, Andrew? Yes, hi, of course. Andre here. Oh, hi, Andre. Nice of you to come. <laughs> um, so, concerning this uh, non-local kernel that you had uh, uh, yes. in in the beginning, so how much do you need to know about the Green's function of 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 the linear operator or of a closed by linearized operator? Yeah, interestingly, to... nothing. So we um, we were motivated to use um, kernels, and indeed. Uh, Kamya was what, one of the first person to do this um, by looking at problems with Green's functions where we know what the kernel is and we ask the question, can we learn it? Um, th because that's a, a, a natural place to start to be non-local. But um, what's remarkable about this architecture is that um, it, it, it's a universal approximator um, between classes of functions without having to put any structure into the kernel. So it's simply the non-locality that comes from the kernel and then the iteration and the application of the of sigma enables you to go from the, 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 the kind of universal approximation theorems of the standard neural network in finite dimensions to very similar results in this infinite dimensional setting. It's, it's kind of surprising yeah. if you'd asked yeah. me a year ago, I would not have thought that was the case, but it is. Yes. Well, I, I suppose also fortunate because if you uh, move to no, non-linear problems. Exactly. You, there is, no, I mean, you might invoke a nearby linear, but it's yes, yes. not necessarily clear what that would be, what one should choose. So it's, it's great that one can do this. And we, we had empirical evidence uh, at, at first, and now there is a developing body of theory. So Sid Mishra, who I'm sure you know at ETH, yeah, yeah. Um, and his student Samuel Landhaler, uh, um, have developed a theory to explain this in an L2 sense. And Nick Kovachki, who is a PhD student here, um, is developing a more general theory, which includes um, working in spaces of continuous functions and other Sobolev spaces. Thank you, Andrew. Very nice. Thanks. Okay, maybe I can, I can briefly jump in here. Is it, so you said it's not necessary to put any structure. Is it helpful to put some structure if you have additional information about your problem, or is that not helping in terms of efficiency of the training? Yes, it, it is helpful. So, um, mm -hmm. firstly, uh, the, the working in Fourier space, which is what we did in all of the examples I showed in the first half of this talk, um, it really helps. It reduces the number of parameters you need to make an effective approximation. So, it's parsimonious and it's also. Um, fast because you get the free transform advantage. Um, so definitely, and, and by the way, the, the, the theory of um, Mischer and Landhal uh, applies to this specific architecture, the Fourier. So d definitely that is the case. Um, empirically, um, we've also looked at, for example, including in the kernel dependence on the input function and uh, I wouldn't say we have systematic understanding of that. No, no understanding from a theoretical point of view, but some evidence that, for example, letting the kernel depend on the input is helpful empirically is also present. But the, um, other than that, it's, you know, there's a lot that can be done with a fairly standard, just viewing KL as a function yeah. and learning, in parameterizing it as a neural network in a standard way. And then the fact that it's then uh, lifted up to become an operator um, gives it this approximation property on spaces of functions. I see, very nice, thanks a lot. Thanks. Okay, Matthew, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, that was a wonderful talk, Andrew. Um, my question is about, so your functional based approach seems to work really well in the examples you show. Do you have a recipe or a things you think people should look for in when to use the functional approach versus the sort of more classical point-wise neural network approach? 
yeah, that's a really good question. So I think uh, everyone to some extent gets driven by their methodology towards examples where it works and the wh why is it working here so well with respect to mesh invariance? It's really because we're using computational models that even when they're discretized are faithful uh, representations of the limiting infinite dimensional object. Um, so in that setting, everything I've described here is highly relevant. And in particular, I think the fact that you can transfer between training on relatively coarse discretizations and then use it at finer discretizations and vice versa is very useful in that setting. However, um, there are many problems where we don't resolve the physics. So the climate modeling is a great example. Um, the, the setting in uh, general circulation models is such that you're using a grid of tens of kilometers that just doesn't resolve physics of clouds, for example. And so you, the, the idea of being close to the infinite dimensional limit in the computational model just doesn't apply. So um, in that setting, I think you, you need a, a very different perspective, which is more about learning model error. So if you, if you have the idea of a continuum model, which you don't have access to, and you have a, a course, uh, course model, which really is not, it, 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 at certain scales, it's not accurate. So there is a, a significant model error. Then uh, I think the, the correct philosophical approach is to focus on learning the model error um, to the discrepancy between the model that you're able to compute with and the, the, the resolved physics, which is too expensive to compute with. So I, I have some uh, work in that direction for ordinary differential equations, and I have some work with a colleague in climate modeling um, in a very specific context of that type. But I think that that's the general message for problems where the physics is not resolved by the model. I think using machine learning to learn about model error is the way to go. And that's not something I described in this talk. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, indeed. Ben. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, th uh, a re really awesome talk. I really uh, love the work. Um, perhaps a related question, I'm not, I'm not sure, but um, I, I, I'm really interested in how these kind of approaches scale to larger domains and kind of equivalent, equivalently um, kind of higher resolutions in the in the solution of the PDE or even even multi-scale solutions as well um, so have you uh, and the related problem with kind of neural networks is this, is their spectral bias so this idea that it's they they, they tend to converge much slower uh, when there's high frequencies in the in the output so I wonder if you have a sense of how these these Fourier neural operators kind of would scale to larger domains and maybe the analogy in a climate model is you know could you input the entire initial initial conditions of the of the earth and do a, a full-blown climate model with, with with this sort of technique yeah so uh, two things let, let me point to something which which is exactly a, a point you've made um if you look at the space this is the ks equation if you look at our ability to predict the spatial correlation um it's pretty poor at uh at large separations. And, and so th this is a problem where there, there is high frequency uh, activity in the problem that it induces correlations at quite long length scales. And we're not predicting them accurately. We're doing slightly better than some other methods, but we have not nailed that problem. So you're quite right that uh, even in this setting here where we're looking at PDs that are close to resolving the um, the underlying the discretization that close to resolving the underlying continuum, it's hard to predict some activity that goes on at high wave number. Um, so that's the first thing. It, but, so the second question you asked was then more about climate. I, I would not wish to claim that we're at a point where you, we could yet j just take a climate model and uh, train it based on its initial condition and do anything useful. And the reason would be is that in climate modeling, the primary hurdle, in my opinion, is to learn about model error or subgrid scale activity and represent it accurately in the simulation. And so I would just argue for trying to use machine learning 
to learn subgrid scale models uh, as being the first thing that should be done in that area, or a first thing that should be done, rather than just try and, and use this blindly for current models. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thanks a lot, David. Um, hi. Um, again, I'd like to reiterate what everyone else said. I think it's a really amazing talk. Um, so um, I've been working um, with some of my colleagues on developing a crystal plasticity model, and um, I'm kind of like more of an experimentalist by trade. So we, we, we've had um, some very uh, good results uh, with the model comparing to some uh, small scale laser uh, experiments, like rate fraction experiments that, that we've um, that we've been doing. Um, so, um, but but one of the trade-offs of that has been is that you know obviously quite complex um, set of differential equations that we have to solve, and that's really caused like performance issues basically. So we can model things that are very small, but any time we try and make make things much larger, it, it causes issues. Um, I think you're talking about these kind of like um, parameters, like hidden parameters. So so in our model, it has like a, um, a set of um, slip systems and then stores like dislocation activity on, on those. Uh, and, then, and then runs a set of differential equations to work out what slip systems are activated, how all the stresses and strains change. Like, is that something that like, I mean, I'm assuming that's that's kind of like, I, I've just had a very, very quick look at your archive paper. I'm assuming that's the kind of thing that was in the model that you were um, kind of trying to emulate. But like the, the performance um, speed ups that you're suggesting would be very useful for my area of work. Um, so so I, I, I guess it's like, could this be expanded to, to um, different, like more, more complex um, crystal plasticity models? And would you expect that the kind of efficiencies you're seeing would remain the same or get better or worse, depending on like the, what the system equations people were using? Thank you. A really good question. So let, let, just winding back to the beginning the, the, of, of what you were saying, the, yeah. these, uh, the, the Xi are the internal variables that keep track through a time dependent model not described here yeah. of the, um, their, their course description of the dislocations and so forth that are going on, going on and inducing inelastic response. So th th that's the connection with that part of the model you described. So the, yeah. Uh, the others understand that. So, um, so just uh, just in in terms of that, like that that obviously you're using some particular model, but if you changed it to a slightly different model, it, yes, it's kind of your approach is independent of the model. You don't really care as long as you get enough training data, you can right, try. You're effectively that, learning that model. Yes, that model has to be good, but um, yeah. but y yes, it's in, it's independent of that how one represents the internal variables. Um, a, a potential limitation of what we've done is that with respect to the small length scale, so I think from what you're saying, you're able to do accurate simulations at small length scales, but the problem is scaling them up to macroscopic predictions. Yes. So yeah. here we, we're using the commonly adopted approach, which is to um, assume that the micro scale is periodic. So, and that is very much um, a limitation of what we're doing, but I, my understanding, I'm not an expert in this area, but my understanding is that that is a commonly used assumption for the micro scale. So the, the, the variation with respect to the short length scale epsilon is small, and we then uh, are able to take a, a unit cell um, at, as is typical in homogenization, and we do the computation uh, on a unit cell defined by this length scale epsilon and compute the homogenized constitutive law um, using that periodic structure. So, um, and we then get the speed ups I've described on this specific model. I yep. think the two things I would say in terms of caveats are firstly, um, everything here is limited by how good the description of the internal variables is, how, how well described the, the dislocation physics that you're talking about, how well that's represented by the internal variables. And secondly, how useful or not it is to work with a a periodic model of the um, microscale structure. Th th those are the sort of modeling caveats. Uh, from a computational point of view, uh, an important caveat is that this model, um, as you progress in time, um, accumulates more and more memory. So that means it's a T squared computation. And th that's a drawback. 
So um, where we would like to go is to try and describe uh, Markovian closures for this. Um, the, the Maurice Swansig formulism, formalism from statistical mechanics is a, is a useful way to think about this. So I think it will be interesting to try and find representations that are Markovian using ex, uh, exponential decay modes to try and make something which is computationally tractable. So we did get fast speed up as I report here, but ev eventually th that's gonna get killed by the T squared nature of the computation. Okay. Can, I, can I just quickly, um, if you go back to the slide before. Yes. Oh, sorry, the one before that. Yes. Uh, sorry, the one before. <laughs> yes. This one, yeah, okay. So, so the, the model that we're using, we're interested in the response of the different crystallite grains. So currently yeah. we mesh up like small grains or whatever. And I guess my question is, does your model then kind of make some average response for each of the grains and just assume that you have some generalized texture and they all behave similarly? Oh, or do the grains each individually behave differently given that you know they're, they're in different orientations, different slip systems were active? Yes, they're, they're, they're all treated individually. So this, this is the unit cell that I referred to. And okay. we would do the computation on this unit cell uh, fully respecting the, the specifics of the microstructure that you see here. And, and the methodology would apply with different microstructures. So yep. we, we have to do computations at the level of this unit cell. Um, and, and then, but you, within that, you can put in whatever microstructure you want. No, um, we that's... generate data here, we train the constitutive model using it. But then the assumption is that this is repeated periodically throughout the domain. Okay, yeah, no, that, that's really interesting because, yeah, like one of the, the ways we were thinking about um, expanding this was to just kind of take a, a, a tail average um, and just kind of say, oh, all of our grains, we're just going to average over that. And then that's a way we could scale this up to, to large systems. But it suggests that this is like maybe a way that, that would even be, be better than that. Which yeah, we're, we're, we're able to, to beat Taylor averaging um, yeah, yeah. By, by using this method in this specific case. Okay, yeah, that, thank you. Uh, so I, I don't want to oversell anything, and so I'm <laughs> very careful of having given caveats both in the climate case and in this case. So I, I, I think this field is very exciting. There are lots of possibilities for using machine learning, and um, I hope that this talk has given some indication of them. But I, I'm just be careful of all the caveats. I think that's an imp important thing. Okay, great. So one last question, Duncan, please. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Andrew. I, I don't take too much of your time, but I was just digesting your answer to Matt's question about the use uh, and your answer, particularly with respect to modeling GCMs, where, as you, as you rightly point out, we don't resolve the key, key processes. Um, is there any opportunity or any way of combining this functional approximation with the point wise? So I'm envisaging perhaps having targeted high resolution simulations that might inform the, the function space combined with course simulations that we can run for a long time. Or yes, is... so, uh, thank you. Um, that, so that is a, a line of work that I'm engaged in with Tapio Schneider. We, we, I haven't described any of that work, but in, in that work, we're trying to learn uh, models for clouds and do so on the basis of data, which is both um, large scale satellite data and um, local computations that are done using um, models of turbulence. So that, that's our goal. Um, we have not got there yet. Um, and so far we have um, mainly looked at the effect of using satellite data to learn about cloud models with relatively small numbers of parameters. But where we're going is to look at non-parametric models of clouds and uh, inform them using machine learning of the type I describe here, but by, by small scale uh, data as well as satellite data. That, that's where we're going. So that's a wish. Right. And, and, that, and that targeting directly this structural uncertainty, this, this unresolved Yes, exactly. To, 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 uh, what I've learned from Tapio is that uh, poor modeling of clouds is a primary component yeah. in the uncertainty that, that, that underlies all of the different GCM models we see. So uh, the objective is to try and get better cloud models and uh, the, the one dimensional in the vertical that describe physics of clouds, learn about them from data and couple them into GCM. 
great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. Well, thanks a lot, Andrew. That was a great end to this seminar series this term. Thanks very Thank much you. indeed. So that's it uh, for this term. I hope you enjoyed it and hope to see many of you again in Mikomis. Cheers. Thank you.